All right. Good morning. It's, uh, it's great to see everyone uh, this morning. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Um, happy Father's Day. You know, uh, there are some people that want to minimize the role of father and mother and all that. We, we, we want to celebrate fathers. Uh, because Jesus told us to identify with God as our Father. And there's that awesome verse that says He's a good Father that loves to give good things to His children. And so we want to honor you fathers. If you're a father, would you raise your hand? Okay. And how about this? If, well... Let's go ahead and pray for our fathers. Can we do that? So, Father, we're so grateful that we can come to you as our good Heavenly Father. And maybe there are some people here this morning who have not had a good experience with an earthly father. Now, that's the sad thing about living in a fallen world, that each of us were designed to be loved perfectly, and sometimes it just doesn't happen. But thank you that you really are a picture of everything a father was given to be. And Lord, we want to bow and we want to set apart every father here this morning. And we want to, Lord, pray your best on them. We pray that you will guide and empower them to be fathers, not only of their household, but in a much wider area in this church. Um, If there are people that need a surrogate dad, someone to look up to, uh, we pray that you begin to match those things up. So, Lord, we're so excited for what you have for us, and we just confess that we have open hearts that are ready to receive whatever you want to pour into them, because like what we just said, you are a good father who loves to give good things to his children, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, and all the people said, amen. Amen. And speaking of Father's Day, this evening, we have a very special event in honor of Father's Day. If you notice inside your bulletin, at 6 p.m., What time? 6 p.m. tonight. We are having our first movie night. And we got a big screen that we're ready to set up. In fact, after the service, if you're able to hang around, we're going to move some of the center pews. We're going to encourage you to bring comfortable lawn chairs if you want, blankets, whatever makes you feel comfortable. We're going to have popcorn. How awesome is that? Ice cream. Uh, We're going to have a good old time watching a great movie. And um, it's Jesus Revolution. A lot of you have seen it. I don't think you can see it too many times. It's life-changing. It's a great opportunity to not only have your family here, but to invite someone because God has reached people through this movie. So it's happening tonight at what time again? Six. Great, great. Also, next Sunday, Feast and Fellowship. When is Feast and Fellowship? Okay, because sometimes, you know, we announce it like six or seven times and people forget, including me. So um, it, what, what's happening next Sunday again? So, uh, hey, bring a lot. Uh, bring your best dish. I need the spinach casserole, Sandra. We got to have that. Um, and let's really enjoy fellowship with one another. Lacey, you look like you have an announcement. Good morning. I'm Lacey Rogers. I am uh, the director of education here at MCC. Sherry, I just want to say you do a fabulous job with the bulletins. And so if you open your bulletin, there is an insert that is all about VBS. So it's all your upcoming dates. We have a volunteer workshop at 4 p.m. on June 30th. That's a Friday. So all of my volunteers, which you guys Huge praise report. I think I have like 22 volunteers. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I've had Sandra Dabney came up and said, I'm so excited about VBS. That's what I want. I want you to be excited about VBS. I want you to be praying for the kids and our volunteers at VBS. On the back side, I have a giant snack list. 
if you can provide some of the snacks, please let me know, and then I'll try, and that way I can kind of mark them on, off the list and tell people the new list so we don't have a bunch of duplicates. So thank you. Keep praying. And uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Lacey's going to lead us in prayer a little bit later, but I want to call your attention to the prayer request inside your bulletin. There's a lot. Sometimes you can get lost in some of these names and concerns. They all matter, okay? Uh, one of the more recent ones that was actually life-threatening that affected um, some people that come to this church was Justin and his wife, Anna. They gave birth uh, to their uh, second daughter, Olivia, and uh, she is doing okay. Anna is in the hospital, and uh, thank you to... Uh, uh, Lacey and Desiree, who went down there, as well as Bruce. Bruce went down there and visited. Some of you know last week, I, it was not one of my greatest weeks. I came down with whatever has been going around, and these guys stepped in and were the church to one another and stayed down there. I think Lacey was down there at 2 o'clock in the morning the other night. Um, the good news is uh, all the vital signs look good for, for Anna. Uh, there was a time when they weren't quite sure. Um, she's getting stronger and better, but now's not the time to let up your prayers. So uh, that's one of the main prayer requests. Again, look at Linda, you went down there too. Um, so um, you can talk to some of these people about uh, about Justin and Anna. Justin was a guy that preached for me last time. He, he had sandals, looked like Jesus a little bit. So uh, a really dear, dear family. So we want to continue to lift them up. Um, I, I was also, I also got a text from Fonda's husband, Bob, and he's having some health issues. Uh, I think he, he, I glanced at the text right before worship. I think he, he broke his ankle or did something to his ankle. We need to pray. We need to pray. Broken, broke his ankle. And Kevin, our own Kevin, who's in the multimedia, he was at the river doing things that old people probably shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and he strained some ligaments in his, his knee, and he's going to get that looked at. So, um, yeah. So let's keep these in our, our prayers. Another Hopkins, Debbie. Okay, good deal. Um, I, I'm going to do something, and I, it's dangerous. I, I'm, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet, and for two minutes, stay in your pew. Greet those around you, okay? Uh, if I tell you to get out of your pew, you'll never get back. But let's spend two minutes. Do you want us to go straight in, or are you going to say anything more? Here's what we'll do. We're going to pretend like we're starting the song just to make them be quiet, and then we'll stop, and then you say it, and then we'll do it again. Hey, Heidi, we're going to do a fake intro to get their attention. Fake intro. One, just like we normally would do. Ready? One, two, three. Worship the Lord, and you, you know what? You can you can sit down, you can stand up, you can raise your hands, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. You can even dance, okay? Percy wants to dance, so everyone look at Percy. Uh, but this is your time to worship together. So, uh, Lord, receive our worship, and all the people said, "Amen." Amen. One, two, three, and.
morning sun. to be back with you. As uh, many of you know, we've been spending more time in San Antonio. My mother-in-law, Michelle's mom, has had some uh, had a broken shoulder, and so there's lots to take care of there. But uh, some of you know, some of you don't, that I my job is I spend a lot of time working with computers and technology. And as such, my brain tends to be a bit analytical when I get into these motions. And especially if, you're, if you've ever been a programmer, you know that there's a lot of conditions. So those conditions would be like, if this happens, then do that. And it's one of the reasons why reading the Bible can uh, really, you know, I can, I, can, I can grab onto it. And the reason is God very oftentimes says, if you will do this, I will do that. If you do this, then I'm going to do this. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, but it's all predicated, God wanting to bless us. And in Psalm 34, I'm going to read you a few verses from Psalm 34 because they're rich, they're good, and it's all about the blessings that come, um, blessings that come to, to, to us when we behave and when we follow the rules and when we follow the guidelines that God has put in place for us to have a rich life. So listen to this. It's just David talking. It's just one of David's psalms. And he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make, a bo- uh, shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. They took or they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. 
the young lions. They lack and they suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall lack nothing. What a great promise. Isn't that great? Um, and so as we continue in our time this morning, let's let the praises of God enter our mouth, come out of our soul as we praise and glorify him, um, which is what we are, one, commanded and called to do. But it's also our great pleasure to get to do that. devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is yesterday like a covenant of hope your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon and mercy for today yourself to me and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on Yeah. 
please. Lord, we thank you because you are great. You're so great. And you're so good. Lord, so we lift up all these prayer requests to you, Father, the ones on the page and the ones in our hearts. You're so good, and you hear each one, Father. We just lift them up to you. We've seen miracles already for Anna Thurman and baby Olivia, and Lord, we just want to thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank you for those, and thank you for what you're going to continue to do, that your presence just fills her room, Father, that the Thurmans feel how loved they are by such a big God. We thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted. So, Lord, everyone that, that doesn't feel close to you, Father, I ask that they would feel your arms around them, that you would speak to them, that you would whisper how much you love them, and that you would draw them back. You leave the 99 and you go after the one. We're so thankful for that. Lord, I see revival in drug houses. Lord, we thank you that you're, you're not a safe God. You're, you don't play by the rules we think you should. Lord, you do all kinds of things. You shake things up. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do, how you're going to shake up our country. Lord, we need revival. We need a great awakening. We need to turn from our wicked ways and seek your face. And, Lord, we do that right now. We fall on our knees and we repent on behalf of our country for all the babies that they've murdered over the years, all the things that they've said is okay when it's not. It goes against your word. Even Christians who have spoken against what the word of God says, Lord, we just repent on their behalf. And we thank you because you are a forgiving God. So, Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do in each each life that needs you, we all need you, Father. We thank you. We thank you for what Jesus did on the cross, that he took our sins and he gave us his righteousness. We want to walk in that, Lord. You've given us authority, and we want to walk in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you have a seat? D.L. Moody was once asked, which is more important, prayer or Bible study? And I love his answer. He said, well, uh, 
which is more important, breathing in or breathing out? And I would go a step further that uh, the most effective prayer, for me at least, is prayer that's rooted in Scripture. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're struggling with anxiety. I find myself praying, Lord, your word says that we can cast all our anxiety upon you because you care for me. And I've also found that the most effective Bible study is done with the attitude of prayer. So let's pray for this time together. Father, we are so grateful that we can gather together in your name. And we're excited for what you want to teach us. So Lord, we open our hearts and, and Lord, we pray that we might have your heart. That we might see and feel what you see and feel when you look at the world. We want to know you better so that we can love you and those around us more deeply. And we pray all this in Jesus' name and all the people said, amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm, I'm, I'm testing you guys. That's my favorite chapter, by the way, Romans 8. Um, and while you're turning to Acts chapter 8, I just want to remind you that the chapters and verses that we have in our Bibles, those markers themselves are not inspired. The word, the text is absolutely, totally inspired, but the chapters and verses were given, I think, around the mid-1500s to help us find our way around the Bible. So when I say go to Acts chapter 8, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the reason I point that out is that you could make a case that the first three verses of Acts chapter 8 really belong in chapter 7. And last week we dealt with the whole chapter. We talked about Stephen, one of the original deacons appointed in the church to oversee the daily distribution. He was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and no one could refute what he was saying about Jesus. And he stands before the Sanhedrin, the the ruling council of the Jews, and he defends the faith, and I love how he does it. He's led by the Holy Spirit. He uses their own history against them. He talks about some of their heroes of the faith. For example, Abraham, how he left his home to go to a place he didn't know where he was going. And the subtle implication is, hey, Abraham accepted these things by faith. Why can't you? Why can't you be a little more open? And then he talks about some of the other patriarchs, people like Joseph and later Moses, who God sent to deliver the people of Israel. And he pointed out that they got a history of rejecting the very people God sent to deliver them out of bondage, to deliver them out of slavery. And he starts talking about how God gave Moses the plans for the tabernacle and how Solomon built the temple. And if there's Two things you don't mess with concerning Jews was the law and the temple. You don't mess with those two. Stephen did both. Uh, Stephen quotes a, a scripture that says, God dwells in temples not made with human hands. And by then they've had it. They scream at the top of their voice. They stop their ears. They charge him. They drag him out of the city. They pick up rocks and they stone him to death. And before they do it, they actually pile their coats before a guy named Saul. Now, we know him by his Roman name after he came to Christ, Paul, but this was before he came to Christ. He was Saul, which implies that this is a guy that has some kind of authority. And as Stephen died, and by the way, he's the first martyr of the church, the word martyr comes from a, a Greek word from which we get the word witness, and that's the ultimate witness, to be willing to lay down your life uh, for the faith. But as he dies, he does two things. He prays that the Lord receives his spirit, and he also prays that the Lord will forgive those that are stoning him to death. Kind of like what Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he died. And that takes us to chapter 8. So let's look at this together. It says, now Saul 
was consenting. The word consenting can be translated voted. Some people actually say that Saul might have been a member of the Sanhedrin. We don't know that for sure. There's nothing in the Bible that says so. But some point out that he might have been a member of the Sanhedrin. And if that's the case, that's really spectacular because that meant a couple of months before he sat on that council when Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin. But again, we don't know that for sure. But he consented or voted to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church. That word great is a Greek word mega. This wasn't some small persecution. This was mega persecution. And they were all, notice the word, scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. They were scattered. And this word scatter is actually a farming term. When you think of farming, don't think of farming like today with a tractor and having rows of, of crops. No, when they farm back then, they would break the ground as best as they could. They would condition it, and then they would basically spread seed all over the place. That's the way they farm. Remember the parable Jesus told of a sower representing the Son of Man who went out to sow his seed representing the Word of God, and it fell on four different soils. One fell on the wayside, that is the path. One fell on the rocky soil, one fell on the thorny soil, and one fell on the good soil, and it, and it was the good soil that reaped an abundant crop. Same thing. And if you think about it, persecution has the same thing. Persecution is like wind is to seed. Wind doesn't hurt the seed. It carries the seed places that the seed would normally never go. Persecution has never weakened the church. It has always strengthened its church. And in fact, my take is that I think, and this might just be me, that the church in Jerusalem had gotten a little bit comfortable because things were happening. People were coming to the Lord not by the hundreds, but by the thousands. They were having all things in common. They were meeting in one another's homes. Signs and wonders were being done. Spectacular things. It don't get any better than this. And I don't know about you, but when things get comfortable, it's easy to sit back and just to enjoy the moment. And I think they needed a little push. So God allowed this persecution to take place. It's kind of like an eagle. You know, when the eaglets, the little baby eagles, are ready to leave the nest, oftentimes they don't want to. So what does mom do? The mother eagle messes up the nest on purpose. She takes out everything soft, and the eaglets, they're not happy. They start flapping their wings. Unknowingly, though, they're strengthening their wings. They're using them. Also, you might not know this about eagles, but they're almost like hummingbirds. They can almost, if the, the wind is right, because they have such a big wingspan, they can almost hover stationary over a nest. That way, showing the little eaglets that they too can fly. And then finally, when they're ready, and mom seems to know when it's time, she kicks out the eaglets one at a time, and they free fall, you know, hundreds of feet. And you can imagine what's going through their mind. They're screaming and squawking and flapping their wings, and mom finally scoops down at the last minute and catches the eagle on her back. And she does this over and over again until finally the eaglet learns how to fly. And I think that's kind of what God is doing with the church. The church had gotten a little comfortable. Time to get them out of the nest. And God uses persecution to scatter them. Remember Acts 1.8? We said it's a summary verse for the entire book of Acts. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the remotest part of the earth. Well, we're seeing this take place right before our very eyes. So they were scattered. Now notice verse 2. It says, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. <clears throat> As for Saul, verse 3, he made havoc of the church. The word havoc describes a wounded wild boar. What does a wounded wild animal do? They go crazy, right? They just attack anything. It's, it's kind of like blood in the water for a shark. 
And that's Saul. Here's this educated, cultured Jew studied under Gamaliel, the greatest of all the teachers, and he's just going crazy. And notice what he's doing. He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And verse 4 says, Therefore, those who were, here's the word again, scattered, went everywhere preaching the word. Now, in verse 5, we hear one of the other original deacons, Philip. By the way, Philip is mentioned later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 21. He's the only one described as an evangelist, Philip the evangelist. And in Acts 21, it's all, it also talks about he, how he had four virgin daughters who prophesied. That's Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Now, most of you know about Samaria, but some of you don't. So let me give you a quick history lesson. And, and this is an oversimplification, but basically after King Solomon, the nation of Israel split in two north-south. The northern kingdom made up of the northern ten tribes was called Israel. The southern kingdom made up of the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were called Judah after the larger tribe. Judah had Jerusalem and as a result had the temple. And between the two kingdoms, Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, Israel, the northern kingdom, was more wicked because it never once had a righteous king. Judah, the southern kingdom, on the other hand, occasionally had a good king that called his people back to repentance, but not so with the northern kingdom. As a result, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken off into captivity, never to return by Assyria. And the way they did that back then, if an empire conquered a people, they would take them off into captivity, and, that's what, and this is what it means. They would transplant those people. They would take everyone that was worth taking and they would transplant them and they would exchange them with another people group that they conquered. And what happened in the case of the northern kingdom of Israel, those Jews that were left intermarried with the people of Syria brought in and they were known as Samaritans. But the Jews looked down on them. They saw them as less than Jews, kind of half-breed. They were racist. Let's call it what it was. Now, the southern kingdom eventually was taken off into captivity, this time by Babylon. But it prophetically, 70 years later, it was written they would return back from captivity, and they did. I mean, that had never happened before. They returned back into captivity. And Nehemiah oversaw the rebuilding of the walls, and Ezra, a priest, called people back to holiness, and he did something radical back then. People that intermarried with people that were not Jews, what did they do, Travis? Told them to break up the marriage so that they could remain pure. And this went to their head. This made them despise the Samaritans who had intermarried. So there was an animosity between these two groups of people that's very hard for any of us to imagine. In fact, it was more intense than modern-day Israelis and Palestinians. Neither group wanted a thing to do with one another. And now the gospel has reached Samaria? I mean, who would have thought? And it gets better. Look at what else happens. And the multitudes, verse 6, with one accord, I love that, they had unity, one accord, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. A lot of people read through verse 7 quickly. I'm not. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. Now, does that happen today? Some people say no. And many were paralyzed and lame and were... Does that happen today? And there was great joy in that city. Now, the reason I ask that is that, you know, some people are like, that was then, this is now. And we had a whole lesson on signs and wonders. And we pointed out at the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus says, these signs will follow those who believe. And he mentions some of these very signs that I just read, spectacular signs. And we pointed out the danger of 
chasing after signs and wonders because I know people who do that. They're after spiritual goosebumps. And they'll go from church to church, place to place, trying to, trying to catch. I almost got caught up in that. When Asbury had their revival, that's where I went to school. I was actually looking at my calendar, thinking about how I could clear it so I could go to Wilmore, Kentucky. And God spoke to my spirit and says, why are you chasing me over there when I'm right here? You see, we're never commanded to go chase after signs and wonders. What we are commanded to do is to go after Jesus. And these signs and wonders will follow those who believe. So the question is, why don't these things happen in our sight today? And in some places in the world, they, in fact, do. So maybe the better question is, why don't they happen here? I used to put up a slide, and maybe we need to resurrect that slide. It asked a question. We flashed it before the service. Are you expecting God to move? Question mark. And right below it, it said, dot, 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 really? And I say that because some people, they go to church out of their religious duty. They do their things. They pay their tithe. They sing their songs. They pray their prayers. They open up their Bible. They have Bible study. But they're not really expecting God to move. Let me read to you from something. Uh, this is an evangelist who lived in the 1700s. He traveled 5,000 miles a year on horseback, going from town to town, city to city, preaching the gospel. I'm talking about John Wesley. He wrote this in his journal. He said, the grand reason why the miraculous gifts were so soon withdrawn was not only that faith and holiness were well nigh lost, but that dry, formal, orthodox men began even then to ridicule whatever gifts they had not themselves and to decry them as either madness or imposture. He goes on to say the cause of this was not because there was no need of them, talking about spectacular gifts. The real cause was the love of many was waxed cold. And finally, he says, this was the real cause why the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were no longer to be found in the Christian church because Christians were turned heathen again and had only a dead form left. Ouch. Remember when Jesus went to Nazareth, his hometown? The Bible says he was not able to do many things. Miracles. I'm like, he's God. What do you mean he was not able? Well, it was because he was hometown boy, Jesus. We know his father, Joseph. They didn't expect him to do anything. And because they didn't expect him, they didn't go to him. So I come back to the question, how big is your God? Do you really expect God to move right here, right now? He wants to, and he's waiting for you to say, here I am, Lord. So, wow, signs and wonders were being done. Great joy in that city. And then in verse 9, it says, there was also a certain man called Simon. And by the way, the very first word in verse 9 is but. It's a word of contrast. Something's being compared and contrasted to. Philip is being contrasted to Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was something great, to whom they all heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Now, people always want to ask, well, was, was Simon saved or not? Well, we'll talk more about that in a moment, and I go back and forth on it myself. But you know, whenever God sows something good among his people, I found that the enemy is there to sow something counterfeit. I mean, every time, he's, he's trying to put up some kind of resistance. Remember that parable Jesus told of the wheat and the tares? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted good seed in his field, and he goes to bed, and an enemy comes at night and sows in 
tares among the wheat. In other words, hey, they're going to be genuine believers. They're going to be false believers. And my guts, and I can't prove this, and the fact of the matter is neither can you. We can't look into people's hearts. But my guts tell me that Simon was not a genuine believer because as you read through the text, and I could be wrong, as you read through the text, it seems like Simon is more interested in the power than Jesus. Again, that, that's just my take. Um, look at verse 11. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And all the people said, Amen. That's a great thing. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Seeing the signs and the miracles. Not so much seeing. You get it. Okay. Verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. I love this. Peter, they sent Peter, that makes sense. He's the rock. But they sent John as well. And uh, John was connected to who? Who was John's brother? James. You might remember there was that one time Jesus and the disciples were making their way to Jerusalem through Samaria. We just got through talking about Samaria. And when, Samaria, when the Samaritans found that Jesus was going to Jerusalem, they didn't receive him. They hated the Jews as much as the Jews hated them. And Peter and John, Jesus called them what? Sons of thunder. Remember what they said to Jesus? Shall we call down fire on these guys? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of. The Son of Man has not come to scare people, but to save them. Now we see John, and part of me wishes James was there as well. They don't have that old spirit anymore. They see what God is doing in Samaria, and they are blown away. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. So Peter and John uh, went to them, verse 15, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> for as yet, he had not fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. This is where it gets a little confusing. We talked about this before. It bears mentioning again because so many Christians today don't have a clue about what I'm about to remind you about. There's a difference between the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, this is in the Gospels, John chapter 20, after Jesus rose from the dead, he appears to the disciples behind closed doors. He says, peace be to you. He breathes on them. And what does he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, they became born again. They had the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Some people make Pentecost, and you can't make it say that. It's taking Scripture out of context and telling it what you want it to say. Some people make Pentecost about receiving the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That's not what it said. They already had the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Indwelling presence. We clear on that? In Acts chapter 1, though, Jesus looks at his disciples, and he says, don't leave Jerusalem without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1.8, we read about what the baptism is. You shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. People call it many different things. I don't want to get lost in terminology. People call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've heard people say it's the upon experience. I've heard people call it the filling of the Holy Spirit. I personally prefer the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you choose to call it. It's a separate thing from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And again, I say that because most believers don't have a clue about this. They think that the two are one and the same, and they're not. And these disciples in Samaria, they believed and they were baptized. They had the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't have the power. 
And Peter and John are sent, and they pray, lay hands, and they receive the power. They receive the power. And if you've never asked for the empowering of the Holy Spirit, I would say, what are you waiting for? I've been in ministry. I've been a pastor for over 30 years. And I, I know the frustration of trying to do ministry in my own strength and my own power, and I sometimes foolishly still do it and fall on my face, and I'm like, I'm never going to do that again. There's a big difference. I mean, how many of you have had an awkward situation? You're going to walk in, you don't have a clue. It's a difficult conflict. You're, you don't know what to say to that person. And right before you go and you say, Lord, would you fill me with your power? And you walk into that, and you say the right thing at the right time. And it's really amazing because sometimes even God can use the words that we miss say. Don't ask me how he can do that, but he can. It's all about him and his power. When we are weak, that's when he is strong. And then it goes on to say, look at verse 18. We talk about Simon again. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He saw the power. Hey, man, I want some of that. How much is it going to cost? Verse 19, saying, give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And notice what he tells them to do. Verse 22, repent. Travis thinks Peter was just having a bad day. Repent. Therefore, what does repent mean? Yeah, get your life straight. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, notice what he said, pray to the Lord for me. Did you catch that? Am I the only one that caught that? Pray to the Lord for me. In other words, you pray. To which if I was Peter, I would say, you pray. You see, Christianity is a very personal thing. I mean, I'm happy to pray with people. I do it all the time. But here's the thing. I can't believe for you. I can't repent for you. That's something only you can do. And some people are like, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. How about this? Help. The Bible makes salvation easy. You know what the Bible says? Whoever calls out on the name of the Lord, what's the rest? Shall be saved. Simon, call out to the Lord. Don't say pray for me. You call out to the Lord. That's not happening here. Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, what do we need to take out of all this? Well, maybe you're here this morning and you believe all the right things outwardly. You have a checklist. Well, I believe Jesus is God. I believe he lived a perfect, sinless life. I even believe he died on the cross, rose from the dead three days later. I'm good, right? That's a demonic faith if you just believe all the right stuff and you never give yourself to what you say you believe. You see... If the enemy can't scare you with persecution, he'll try to deceive you like the serpent. It's not what you do. It's who you know. It's who you trust. And, and maybe you've been doing that for years. You, you, I'm good. I believe, I believe all that. But have you given your life to him? How do you do that? You give your life to him. You say, in effect, hey, my life is a wreck. I can't live it. Take it. Take the title of my life. Don't just save me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my friend. I want to have a relationship with you. And what he will do is so much more. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll give you a fresh new start. He'll fill you with peace and joy. What do you got to lose? 
Maybe that's you this morning. But maybe you've done all that. Man, you're, you're good. You, you believe all the right stuff, and you've given yourself over to that which you believe. You are right with God. You know that you know that you know that you're right with him. That is an awesome place to be, to know that Jesus will never leave or forsake you, that he's with you at all times and all places, but maybe, maybe you've never really asked God to empower you. Maybe. And if that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask us all to stand. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. We're going to have a closing chorus in just a few moments. But I just want to lead us into a time of prayer. And maybe you don't fit into either one of those two categories. Maybe you know the Lord and you kind of walked away from him. I love telling people this. You might be a thousand steps away from the Lord, but how many steps is it back? One. Maybe you need to take that step. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word. Oh, Lord, speak to our heart. We don't want to just know about you. We want to know you personally. And it's awkward, I understand. But if there's anyone here this morning, maybe this is starting to make sense. Maybe up until now, you've been into religion, doing your thing, going to church, doing this, doing that. I believe all the right stuff, but you, you don't really know Jesus personally. And your spirit is awake to him this morning, which is an awesome thing. That means today can be the day of salvation. Today could be the day that you surrender what you understand of yourself to what you understand of Jesus and let him do the rest. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that wants to do that, I'm going to ask you, every eye closed, let's not look around, but if that's you, I want to see who you are. If you're ready to do that, if you're ready to be right with God and to have a relationship, would you just slip up a hand this morning? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for Thank you for that. I see two. There's always room for more. Oh, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will honor. Honor your children who have surrendered their life to you this morning. I ask that you bless them. I ask that you will own them. Not as a servant, but as a son or daughter of the living God. I ask in their heart of hearts right here, right now, you'll enable them just to surrender, to ask you to come in, to fill every dark place with your light, to fill you with peace, to fill you with joy. Now I'm going to ask if anyone wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit, would you raise up your hand? See a lot more hands. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Holy Spirit, you saw every hand raised. An invitation for you. You already indwell those that belong to you, but they want your power not to show off, not to be a magician like Simon, but to show people that your love is real. So in the name of Jesus, we ask that you fill that you empower, that you baptize with the Holy Spirit those who just raised their hand unto you. Lord, we love you. We are so excited for what you're doing in this church, in this community. And Lord, lead us, guide us. We are, we are so wayward without you. So be our daily compass. Be our guide, be our strength, be our light. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. He is good. He is good. Amen. Hey, did you catch what Bill said before? He said, with the enemy, the devil, he tries to scare you with, 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 with getting scattered.
to send you out. Or the cat doesn't work, then he tries to deceive you. But you know what's even better than that is, and it was showed up in that verse that it, from Psalms that I read earlier, is that the Lord sends his angels to protect us. And let's proclaim that in this last chorus this morning. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. Oh, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The Get that. Uh, speaking of which, Lee was shouting at me, and I asked him to remind me, if you are our guest, we hope that you feel welcome. Uh, we do have a special gift for you at uh, the welcome desk, and we certainly hope that you stop by the welcome desk and receive that gift and receive our love and hospitality, and if there's anything else we can do, please let us know. And finally, you know, for those that raise their hand, we have some literature here one of the great things is from Billy Graham Crusade. It's called, it's a little booklet, My Heart, Christ Home. It describes the heart as a home with every little room serving a purpose. This is a great way to start out your life. As well as uh, living in Christ, it has the Gospel of John and some other scriptures that help you get started. We have these for you up here. So there's a time of prayer up here. We ask that you treat the altar as a holy place. Uh, the rest of you, have your coffee, have your cookies, enjoy one another. If you're a guest, receive our gift. And I forgot what's happening next Sunday again. What's happening? Feast and fellowship. Bring your best. Tonight, what's, what's up tonight? 6 p.m., Jesus Revolution. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Amen.